next we're going to talk about motivation. And as we said, this is critical for how it drives learning in the first place. Interestingly, you know, behaviorism as a field kind of focused all on these external sources of motivation, uh, this reward and punishment signals. But really, when you think about it and you really understand what people are all about, it seems like these internal intrinsic forms of motivation uh, are much more important to uh, determine how people behave. And, and as we go forward, we'll see in the uh, thinking chapter and the social chapter, this kind of notion of you know, internal locus of control, uh, this sense of people as agentic. It's, it's really tied up with our whole focus on control throughout the entire course is all about this internal motivation, this ability to establish your own personal goals follow your own star, so to speak, uh, really guide your own path in life. And that's so important for people starting it around the age of two with the, the temper tantrums that we've talked about. Um, that's really the onset of this kind of individual determination of your own course of life. And so, you know, I think it really stands in contrast to this behaviorist idea that, you know, yeah, all you need to do is deliver these kind of rewards and shape people's behavior. And that's gonna kind of, you know, how, how people uh, explain how people really learn. Skinner famously uh, thought that he could, you know, explain how people uh, learn and put, you know, babies in these Skinner boxes, training them up on all these kind of associations, operant conditioning between lights and buttons, et cetera. But yeah, it's not, that's not really what makes people tick. But to try to understand what does make people tick, drive reduction theory, was one of the earlier attempts to formulate uh, some sort of internal uh, factors that are driving uh, behavior. And so Hull, Clark Hull famously introduced these ideas. So our need for basic things like food and water then gives rise to these aversive kind of drive states uh, like thirst and hunger. If we're not getting enough of that need, then uh, there's that kind of aversive state, which is the drive, which then causes us to do these kinds of behaviors that reduce that aversive state. And certainly that's true at some level of description that when you're thirsty, you are motivated to, you know, drink um, and you drink until your, you know, kind of thirst is quenched. Uh, so at some level that has to be part of the story, but, you know, not everything really sort of fits in that simple kind of framework. Here's, uh, you know, part of the brain that's really important for these kind of basic low level needs. Uh, so the lateral hypothalamus uh, and different areas of the hypothalamus. So you have, uh, you know, very low level things in terms of blood pressure and body temperature and these kind of feedback loops, uh, this system kind of monitoring the state of the body and then uh, adjusting uh, things like blood pressure to fit set points or targets that the body has established. Um, so you have that with respect to kind of water balance, if you have too much salt, um, you know, regulating all parts of the body to try to maintain these kind of target ranges of all the kind of critical bodily functions. Um, and this includes, you know, uh, these other nuclei involved in feeding, uh, satiety, uh, and, and other kinds of things like body temperature. So really all these very low level basic things are controlled through the hypothalamus. And it does actually, uh, through the uh, pituitary nucleus, actually release real hormones that then change the uh, state of the body in response to these state variables. This part of the brain is well, well described by that kind of whole theory, at least in principle. Abraham Maslow introduced this notion of a pyramid that uh, puts that kind of physiological stuff in, in this kind of lowest, most basic level of the pyramid, but then critically kind of establishes these higher levels of need that don't really fit within that kind of, you know, internal state uh, uh, kind of framework. And in fact, if you look at the, the highest levels here, they're all very much defined in terms of social interaction and place in society. And this, again, is a theme that we'll return to over and over again about how socially motivated we are as people. We really uh, are very strongly influenced by our place in society and our interactions with other people. And so beyond these kind of basic physiological core kind of needs for food and water, et cetera, um, and this kind of basic need for safety, 
uh, financial as well as kind of more uh, concrete levels of safety. Um, then once you have satisfied those kind of lower levels, the notion of this hierarchy is that then that allows you, it gives you a foundation to build upon to sort of uh, work on some of these higher levels. So family, intimacy, relationships, this kind of interesting case of uh, steam, uh, sort of really your place in society. And then finally, this idea of, you know, this kind of very highest level of self-actualization, this uh, ability to really achieve your own personal goals in life um, and have a sense of of accomplishment there, that that's kind of driving us forward. We want to have some meaning in our lives, um, these high level goals, the highest level goals. And so those provide kind of the top level thing. And again, if you're really not feeling safe or you're not having your basic physiological needs met, then you really have a hard time engaging in those higher levels of, of kind of plans. And so that's the sense in which you know, this, this, this pyramid has this kind of dependency relationship built in. So this is, you know, it's, it's very heuristic. I think it's very sensible. Uh, it makes sense of a lot of uh, intuitive uh, aspects of uh, how we think about ourselves and our internal drives. And if we think about kind of what are these kind of goal states, these needs, these, these higher level desires or, or plans that we have in our lives, we know that there are these certain brain areas that are very important for engaging in, in goal-driven behavior. And so this is a, a picture of three of these really critical uh, goal-related brain areas, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and the orbital frontal cortex. Each of these plays a somewhat different role working together to overall uh, shape and, and represent uh, kind of our uh, overall goal system. So we can think of this as a kind of tripartite representation of an overall goal. And in particular, uh, the orbital frontal cortex named for the kind of orbits of the eyes, it's right above that. Uh, it seems to be really important for representing outcomes. So what at a kind of basic reward-like level you know, am I going to get a piece of chocolate cake? Am I going to get some money? What is it that I'm going to get if I achieve my goal, right? Am I going to get that sense of fame or recognition or self-esteem, some kind of social goal? You know, all that is kind of uh, encoded in patterns of firing in the OFC. And then the ACC seems to be really important for integrating that kind of information about like how valuable is the different outcomes that I could get with uh, the, some information about the specific plan that we might think about actually achieving that. So if I have to you know, climb Mount Everest in order to get this outcome, gee, that's a lot of work. I don't know if, I, if it's worth it. Maybe I could do something simpler, like you know, going to out, outside and getting a donut <laughs> and uh, more a Homer Simpson level uh, amount of effort. So the ACC we think is kind of weighing the cost benefit ratios essentially of different possible plans that we might have, how much effort it's gonna take, what's the likelihood of success, um, and then kind of integrating that with the strength of the reward. And overall, the whole of these systems together with the DLPFC representing kind of the specific kind of overall plan of action that we might be considering, um, all three of those work together to sort of come up with the best actual concrete plan at this moment in time that's going to lead to the highest chance of reward and at the lowest cost okay so just your very basic kind of calculation of what 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 is the most sensible thing to do uh, at the at any given moment in time and we think you know these things might be engaged thinking about different time scales so you have like more immediate goals more long range goals and so of course there's different information you're taking into account at these different levels. And certainly, you know, when you think about your short term goals, you want to think about how that fits with these longer term goals. And so there's lots of issues about the kind of time scale over which you're thinking about these kind of planning actions. But it seems, according to lots of different uh, uh, evidence, that these areas have these kind of separate contributions. And then once you kind of engage in selecting a particular overall kind of plan, uh, uh, representation up here that includes all three of these type of representations, we think that the basal ganglia is really important for engaging those goals. And then uh, once they're kind of in there, they're being maintained in the frontal cortex, 
And then they're kind of guiding our selection of actions, which takes place in more kind of posterior areas of frontal cortex. So this is how you actually kind of carry out the overall plans up here. And then we think, you know, for example, that the OSC will continue to monitor the world and say, am I getting closer to that desired outcome or not? You know, is that, is that, are we making progress or not? Uh, the, the, the DLPFC can, in this maintained way, kind of guide these uh, specific action steps and, and help you decide what to do next. And ACC can kind of continue to monitor, ooh, are things more difficult, less difficult than I thought they were going to be? Maybe we should think about doing something else. Um, that kind of whole process, we think, can be understood in terms of the interactions and dynamics uh, taking place in these different brain areas. And again, it's all about a system between those frontal representations and then the basal ganglia really playing this critical role using that dopamine-based learning that we just talked about to decide, you know, this is the best option right now. I'm going to sort of select that action and say, this is what I'm going to do. And then along the way, it helps decide individual steps and update as we go through. Um, so basal ganglia always playing that critical kind of uh, decision-making role throughout the whole process. So at least at a kind of hand-wavy level, that's, that gives us a pretty good sense. We're trying to work on computational models that uh, really implement how those dynamics in more specific ways. But that, that gives you a good kind of big picture sense about how different parts of the brain might work together to, to support this internal goal-driven behavior. We saw this slide earlier as well. This is kind of a map of uh, the medial and lateral areas of your frontal cortex. So the medial here, the slice through the middle of your brain. Uh, here's those anterior cingulate cortex areas that we just talked about. And conveniently, they're kind of right next door to these uh, prefrontal cortex areas like the DLPFC. And so there's a nice kind of local circuitry there that can support taking those kind of emerging plans and sort of evaluating the utility and getting information done here from these OFC areas in this more ventral and lateral parts of the frontal cortex, integrating that information and coming up with this kind of overall estimate of, you know, what is what's worth doing. And then maybe once you decide what you want to do, this most anterior kind of area right here in the ACC called the perigenual ACC may be particularly important for sort of like engaging and activating and motivating you towards doing something. It seems to be important for for modulating arousal and drive towards actually achieving your, your selected goals. This area here in area 25, subgenual ACC seems to be particularly important for representing negative kind of affective states. So things are, when maybe when things aren't going very well, you're getting bad outcomes, it kind of integrates that kind of negative information. Whereas this kind of medial OSC area down here in 13 may be encoding more positive information uh, and then as you go out in this more kind of lateral area of frontal cortex going out, um, that's more kind of specific uh, sensory information and more about these kind of specific outcomes. Is it going to be like that really moist chocolate cake or is it going to be more dry chocolate cake? That matters to me. So I don't want to know, you know, what what exactly am I getting here? And, and sort of that more visceral level uh, sense of what is the actual reward going to be. And so this ties in directly with what's called the insula, where you have more primary somatosensory type representations of those things like taste. So it really kind of makes sense, all the different parts as well within the, the, the anatomy here and how they interact uh, in the context of that overall picture of how goals unfold.